Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DORA 10th Anniversary Asia-Pacific Plenary Session, DORA at 10, a look at our history and the bright future of responsible research assessment. I'm Dr. Haley Hazlett, Acting Program Director of DORA, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today. To begin, I'll review our code of conduct for this call. Do you know, DORA is a community with shared aspirations to improve academic assessment, and we're all working towards the same goal. And so we do ask that participants follow the community conduct rules of DORA's administrative entity, the American Society for Cell Biology, and the link to those will be posted in the chat momentarily. We ask that you keep comments respectful, constructive, collegial, and to the point. And I also have a few additional reminders. This call is being recorded and will be shared publicly. Closed captions are available. And we ask that you use the chat to contribute to the discussion. So if you have a question, place it in the chat. Or if you see a question that you're interested in and you'd like to see answered, give it a thumbs up. During this two hour plenary event, we, we will hear opening remarks from Ginny Barber, Vice Chair of DORA. This will be followed by a keynote address from Mehar Sham and a Q&A. After a 10 minute break, we'll move on to the second half of the program, a panel discussion with experts around the world where we'll hear about their experiences with and aspirations for responsible research assessment. Now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ginny Barber, Vice Chair of DORA. Ginny is the Director of Open Access Australasia, EIC at the Medical Journal of Australia, an adjunct professor at Queensland University of Technology, and was one of the three founding editors of PLOS Medicine, where she served as chief editor. In addition to her leadership at DORA, Ginny is a passionate advocate and has been involved in many open access publishing and ethics initiatives, including her work as chair of the Committee on Publication Ethics, or COPE. Over to you, Ginny. Thanks very much, Haley. I will just share my screen. I'd just like to, a um, 10th anniversary plenary session, history and where we might be going in the future. Um, before I said that we are on, um, I live in Yanjin in Brisbane, and that's the Turrbal and Yagara people who are the owners of this land. And to acknowledge the important role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island and other Indigenous people within research and scholarship. So I'm going to give you a quick tour through what Dora's past 10 years, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our future. These slides were developed by Stephen Curry, Haley, and myself, and uh, Stephen will be presenting them later on at our, our second plenary of today. So let me just turn my... Okay, so where, where, did, um, where did Dora come from? I think it's fair to say that um, people have been concerned about research assessment for quite some time. Um, I first really became aware of the issues around research assessment when I was working at PLOS Medicine. Um, and in 2006, when we were about to get our first impact factor, I was really kind of horrified about the fact that the journal that would work so hard to be innovative and to uh, show the best really in, uh, in um, publishing and, and really trying to change the way that medical publishing was done was going to be measured on this one simple uh, metric that we knew was highly problematic and didn't reflect the journal's worth overall. Um, so we wrote this editorial called The Impact Factor Game back in 2006, which ironically has become one of the most cited papers within, within PLOS Medicine. But at the same time, many other organisations and individuals were thinking about research assessment. Um, and DORA really came out of a meeting that was held in December 2012 at the ASCB conference in San Francisco, where the research assessment, uh, DORA, the Declaration on Research Assessment, called the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, was, was drafted and then launched the following year. 
And you can see in the middle that the follow up to this panel uh, to this uh, meeting, uh, they talk about the the need for the scientific community is finally rebelling against its own complicity in the use of a deeply flawed metric and the idea of launching a rebellion. So this was really something that was quite passionately felt among the people that were present at that meeting, quite a few of whom are still involved with, with Dora today. Stephen Curry, um, back in 2012 in August, also wrote uh, his own piece on um, research assessment, where he talked not, not just about the problems of research assessment overall, but the, the kind of really rather ridiculous um, way that the impact factor was calculated, which, to be honest, not even many people are, are able uh, to kind of quote when they're asked about it. So this is what Dora looked but like back in 2013. It was it was a web page with a, um, a declaration that you could sign up to. Um, what was really interesting about it was that there were 17 recommendations as part of the, um, the DORA declaration, the key one of which was to not use journal based metrics as a surrogate measure, not just of research papers, but crucially not of researchers themselves. Um, and, but overall, the recommendations were positive recommendations and were designed to encourage um, people to think quite deeply about research assessment. Other work was going on at the same time and other thinking back in um, uh, 2015. Um, there was the 350th anniversary of the Royal Society's first journal, Philosophical Transactions, which is actually where I met uh, Stephen Curry first. Um, and we talked about research assessment there, amongst other things. And that was where a number of organisations uh, began to think about what the future should look like. But of course, Dora at this time was just a just a website. And uh, there's an email here that Stephen wrote to Mark Patterson, who was one of the, also one of the key individuals. He was involved at PLOS in the early days and at eLife. Um, and he was one of the drivers of trying to get um, a, a Dora um, to become more than just a research, uh, just a website. So how did we get from, 20, from 2013, where our website looked like this, through to 2023, where it looks like this, and all the associated initiatives? Well, the key to this was really funding. So Stephen and a small group of um, passionate group advocates uh, realised the, the need to secure funding in order for us to be able to take Adora from more than just from more than just a declaration to be a movement, and all the funders that are listed here have been really key to um, Dora becoming a sort of fully fledged uh, organisation that we have now. I'd like to particularly call out here the ASCB, who continue to be Dora's host institution, and they've been really important in providing stability for the organisation over the long term. But the funders here you can see range from very large international ones through to individual um, institutions. Here's a, here's a timeline of Dora, which, which takes us through right from the very beginning, the initial planning meeting at, in December 2012. Um, the publication of Dora, which exactly was exactly 10 years ago today, so um, the anniversary is, is very well timed. Um, and in between, a whole set of things happened that turned Dora from um, this, uh, this, just a declaration into sort of uh, something that was much more um, substantial. The key things are highlighted in red, and I'd just like to quickly talk through them. The first thing I would say is the, the importance of this early um, an adoption of a funding and steering committee that were able to drive um, Dora from being just from more than just a declaration. But really key to this was also the appointment of uh, staff who've been absolutely crucial to the to Dora um, getting the recognition and doing the work that it does today. So Anna Hatch, who many of you may know if you've had any um, involvement with Dora in the early years, was appointed as, us, as a community manager back in 2017 and later became the program director. Director. She moved on to HHMI and Haley is now the interim program uh, director and was appointed as program manager just before that. Also really key to the work that Dora has done is the recognition that it's truly international initiative. So it was never intended to just be North American or European. We recognised very early on the importance of having truly international um, representation on Dora first with an advisory group which was formed back in 2019 and then in 2022 we revised the governments and the globals to form a global steering committee which has also led to us to not just be able to have representation globally but to have representation across uh, multiple disciplines so this is what Dora looks like today. Um, Anna Hatch was our previous programme director, as I said. Um, Haley is our acting programme director at the moment, and we have two fantastic policy associates, and we've had previous policy associates in the past. Uh, the steering committee has 28 members from, from around the world. Um, and in addition to that, we have a small uh, subgroup, which is the executive board, which is able to provide advice on a day-to-day -day basis um, to Haley and the rest of the staff. 
So what was really key to um, Dora being able to take um, a step forward? So in 2018, we developed our first strategic plan. Um, the key things here were firstly around promoting the declaration to get more signatories. But as I said, signatories were not the only um, it, point of Dora. We wanted to do more than just be a, um, a declaration. We really wanted to extend Dora's global and disciplinary impact. And the disciplinary one was a really critical one for us because we know that there are multiple issues across different disciplines with regard to research assessment. And we also wanted to develop and promote best practices in research assessment because that was what we were hearing continuously was that there is a real need for uh, practical tools. So what did that look like? Um, it, the website now contains a range of um, uh, initiatives that really kind of develop and promote good practice and highlight good practice from around the world. We do a number of things. So, for example, we do briefings with funders and other related organisations. We do a lot of outreach, so articles, webinars, conferences and workshops. All of these are part of the work that Dora does on a regular basis. There's a curated resource library and I. I think there's some really interesting pieces of work in this. For example, highlighted on the left is the um, um, the piece of work on the importance of unintended cognitive biases that happen during research assessment. And that has been really important in when you're thinking about how to change research assessment, to think about the whole um, aspects of around it, not just the sort of um, thinking about metrics. Other things that we have are case studies, and these have been developed from around the world, and these are particularly useful for institutions or other organisations that are thinking about research assessment um, to see what can, they can look at, which may be relevant to their own organisation. Last year, we were able to, uh, uh, to put out some community grants, which supported um, small groups of individuals and organisations that um, were doing specific work on research assessment. And in all of this, we work collaboratively with organisations across the world. I'll come on to the development of Tara in, in the next couple of slides. But one particular tool that I'd like to highlight is the narrative CV. So again, Dora was not the only organisation that was thinking about um, uh, the narrative CV. Um, the Royal Society had this idea of a resume for researchers and the tra charity Hos University Hospital in Berlin was also thinking about a different way of having uh, CVs for researchers. But the narrative CVs that we're really keen to um, promote and, and explore, the intention is that they move away from simple long lists of research publications, that they're value based for organisations, that they're structured so that they can diver uh, address diverse qualities of research but, and facilitate comparison in a fair way. They are evidence based and crucially what we uh, feel as these narrative CVs be begin to be used is that it's really important that they are tested and assessed um, and that we are very mindful of not introducing unintended biases or unintended consequences as they're adopted. So, for example, we would not want to see um, early career research is disadvantaged by a, a new way of um, promoting, um, uh, promoting their research. So what's the latest thing that Dora is doing? Um, Project Tara, the tools to advance research assessment, which is made available, made, made possible by a very generous grant from the Arcadia Foundation, um, comprises three key things at the moment. So an interactive online dashboard, which will facilitate discovery of research assessment practices globally, a survey of US institutions to understand their attitudes and approaches to research assessment reform and the development of a toolkit which will be available uh, globally. Um, on this slide, you can see the steering committee for T Project Tara, which includes Sarah de Reich, who will be the plenary speaker at the, um, the next um, plenary that's happening later today. But in all of what we do, it's clear that we're part of a global community that is thinking about research assessment. We have um, a number of uh, organisations have been thinking about it from multiple different routes. And I'll just highlight a few of them as we go uh, to think about. So the Metric Tide, which was uh, published in 2015 by Stephen Curry and um, some of his colleagues, and which was updated earlier this year, was really important in thinking about research assessment in the UK. In November 2019, the Room for Everyone's Talent, the uh, an initiative that was um, uh, countrywide in the Netherlands, again, has been really important thinking about this on a large scale. So some of these are from large scale funders and some of them are from countries and some of them are from smaller initiatives, but all of them are, are kind of key to thinking about research assessment from a number of different angles. The one I'd, I'd like to highlight in particular is the UNESCO recommendation on open science, which was um, adopted in November 2021 
which calls out the importance of research assessment and specifically DORA in thinking about the future of open science. And then in July 2020, the Hong Kong principles were published. These came out of a piece of work that was done at the Research <coughs> World Congress on Research Integrity that was held in Hong Kong. And I'm delighted to say that Mei Ha Sham, who is one of the authors of this, and will be the keynote speaker in just a moment. So as you can see, there's a very diverse group of organisations that are contributing to discussions around research assessment uh, globally. And this also played into a discussion that happened uh, in 2020 when uh, Stephen Curry, Anna Hatch and myself wrote this blog called The Intersections Between DORA Open Scholarship and Equity. And what we were thinking about here was that uh, DORA is part of a whole change in the research ecosystem and indeed the research culture that we're seeing globally. <clears throat> and what's really important to understand is that um, when you change one part of research assessment or if you change reform open scholarship, it, it's linked into everything else. And underlying all of this is the research culture and how we value different people across the, um, the global ecosystem. So I'll end with just this, um, this last slide talking about the next 10 years. We have a new strategic plan. Uh, we have four parts to that. So one is around increasing awareness of negative impacts of specific metrics and encouraging the use of positive um, new metrics. We'd like to think about developing clear and concrete measures to reform research assessment. We're developing tools to do that. We're very keen to continue to work globally with advocates of research assessment um, globally. And finally, we're, uh, for, for, for Adora itself, it's important that we remain a sustainable organisation. So I'll end with this quote from Atul Gawande, who talked about this idea about how um, ideas propagate around the world. And of course, we talk a lot about um, uh, technology and we'd love to see just things happen at a press of a button. But we know that in the end, people talking to people is still how the world's standards change. And I'm very proud that Dora has been able to do that for the last 10 years. And that's what we hope to do over the next 10 years. So thank you. So now it's my great pleasure to hand over to uh, Meha Sham to give the, the keynote presentation for this session. So uh, I've had the great pleasure of meeting Meha Sham on a number of occasions. Professor Meha Sham, she's the Pro Vice, Vice Chancellor and Vice President of Research at the Ch Chong Ming Lee Professor of Biomedical Sciences at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Her research focuses on the molecular mechanisms of mammalian development and human congenital disorders. And she's currently the president of the Hong Kong Society for Development Biology. At the Chinese University of Hong Kong, she oversees the strategic development of research and innovation, entrepreneurship, technology startups, knowledge transfer, and research impact at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. She's currently a member of the governing board of the World Congress on Research Integrity Foundation. Meiha, over to you. Thank you very much, Jeannie, for your kind introduction and also for inviting me to this uh, very um, uh, important event in celebrating 10 years of DORA. So in my presentation, I'm going to follow the, uh, the thread of what Jeannie has introduced, uh, talking about research assessment in the last 10 years and looking forward to the future. So in my talk, I will be talking, uh, I will give some introduction about research assessment as well as a review of some initiatives in improving the research assessment system. I will focus quite a bit on the role of institutions and it will become clear as I am uh, moving on in uh, uh, introducing a few points. One, the main uh, task for today uh, for me will be to address the challenges in implementing DORA despite the large number of signatories and, uh, you know, 10 years on. And I would also like to focus a little bit in addressing the difficulties in implementation of DORA in the Asia Pacific regions. Uh, in particular today, our plenary is really the Asia Pacific plenary. There will be another plenary to follow later today. Uh, if there is time, I will share some examples of implementation, but I will probably leave this to a discussion or Q&A and see how it goes. Now, regarding research, I think the core of our research activities are the researchers. And uh, researchers, by and large, uh, do abide to a few of these principles and accountability. So we are expected to act in a responsible and honest way and to conduct research that is valid and trustworthy. And we are all very happy and responsible 
uh, in the sense of being accountable to the public, be it to our funders, our uh, professional bodies, if it is in the medical health uh, uh, um, arena, and it is abiding to the medical and health decisions or just public policies that affect the society. For institutions, the obligation is very simple to provide education and training for the researchers and to support them so that the research can be conducted in the highest standards. So when we talk about research quality, this is these are the quality that we're talking about. Nevertheless, when we come to research assessment, what we are looking out for as attributes are a little bit different. We'll be looking out for something um, as Jeannie was talking about, you know, impact and publication and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, when it comes to uh, accountability and assessment of research, if the research community is just between the institutions and the researchers where they are working in, then the world will be a lot simpler. Nevertheless, institutions and the researchers are in a, very, a much larger research community. Uh, for publicly funded uh, universities and institutions, the relationship with the government and the grant agencies are very close. Uh, for the researchers, other than these, they will also work very closely with publishers, professional bodies. If they are working on translational research, their relationship with industry is also very close. Nowadays, a lot of the research are cross-disciplinary and team-based work. So the collaborators will be working in other institutions. So therefore, inter-institutional relationship and the harmony in institutional practices that does play a lot in terms of research assessment. So I will focus on a little bit from the point of view of the perspective of universities, uh, as you will all see, is that because there will be alignment between the performance indicators for universities and the people and the researchers who are working in it. Uh, in research, of course, we look at the research output and the research income. The output, generally speaking, is in the form of publications and citation impact. The research income will be competitive research grants. In our part of the world, there is increasing emphasis on translational research. So patterns, industry collaboration, all of that are what the universities will drive. Nevertheless, until today, when we come to research assessment, these components uh, have not been assessed very systematically. Of course, the awards and distinctions of our researchers, our professors and students contribute to the reputations uh, of the university and by and large at the end of the day it will all aggregate and affect the world rankings and elite tables. I will use a few examples of uh, larger scale, you know, large scale research assessment exercises, just as an example. Uh, I'm not really dwelling on it, but I just use these examples as these examples are also very close to myself in, in Hong Kong and our research grant body, Research Grant Council and uh, have been adopting the uh, large scale research assessment exercises. The goal is of course to encourage world-class research and drive research excellence uh, for the research institutions and the universities in a particular region. And of course to review and identify areas of research strength and opportunities in order to develop research strategy. But very important of all is to allocate funding appropriately so that uh, appropriate directions and strategies will be developed for the region. So the last um, research assessment exercise in Hong Kong was in 2020, but in Australia, there was also the excellence in research in Australia and in UK, there is REE and REF. These, uh, you know, these few places are following a very similar model of funding agency-based large-scale research assessment exercises. So here I put down a few timelines. So Jeannie explained very clearly about DORA and now we are in a 10 year anniversary. So for the time being, let's just look at the last 10 years, just looking into the past. So the UK uh, started this uh, RAE exercise. Uh, I will share a little bit about sort of the mechanism and some of the scoring for the RAE. And we in Hong Kong have been adopting a very similar uh, assessment protocol and assessment uh, scale. For Australia, as far as I know, uh, uh, quite a similar scoring mechanism is also adopted. So from the archive, uh, we, we can see RAE 2008. This is actually before DORA. So this four-star scaling system, you know, one star, two star, three star, four star, in order to assess particular items of research output, generally in the form of publication, 
to indicate well-leading, internationally excellent, or recognized internationally or nationally recognized, you know, as scale of assessing research output. I think all of us are very familiar with journal impact factor for a particular piece of research uh, article. But when it comes to institutional and a unit of assessment, I'm a biomedical scientist. So this example is from preclinical and human biological sciences. So the scale of assessment of an institution is reduced to percentage of research output that are scored four star, three star, two star, or one star as a way to distinguish the performances, to distinguish performance of uh, various universities. In the UK, of course, it will inform funding. And in some other places, like in Hong Kong or in Australia, I think there will be, uh, uh, to, some, to some extent, also inform funding, but also for us to recognize the sort of the research uh, performance landscape. Now, that was 2008. By 2014, the uh, spectrum of research assessment is broadened a little bit. Uh, impact cases was introduced. So therefore, other than the research output as mostly research articles, the impact of these research publications in the society is written in the form of impact cases and will be assessed. The scoring is still one, two, three, four stars. So therefore, this is like an, a kind of metric for evaluating university performance. And it goes on, okay, after 2014, uh, the last exercise, uh, REF 2021, this is the result. And uh, the major scaling mechanism is still one, two, three, four stars. The changes is uh, perhaps in the emphasis of uh, putting the percentage of the weighting of these, these star weightings in impact, as well as the research environment as a result. 40% of the overall assessment is based on the impact of the research as well as the research assessment. The traditional research output in the form of journal articles and other forms of research output will constitute 60%. So there has been changes in the way that these large scale research uh, assessment has been uh, uh, progressing in the UK. But the UK assessment system has great impact on the other parts of the world. I'm aware that not very, you know, uh, it, it is not that in um, many countries, large scale research assessment exercises are conducted in similar way. In Hong Kong, we have been doing so for some years. So we adopt similar scaling system and the, the percentage um, of the assessment on the research output in the form of publications, as well as impact cases and environment are slightly different, but by and large, the so-called metrics for particular universities is represented by these so-called one, two, three, four star performance. So the result of the RAE 2020 for Hong Kong is shown that 70% of the research that is conducted in Hong Kong have been rated as uh, either world leading or internationally excellent. So, I have been talking about assessment of a research institute or a university. And in large scale research assessment exercise, clearly there's a bit of bias towards certain form of research output or outcome, even when impact cases and research environment are put into consideration. There are many other aspects of research activities and research performance that actually affect the reputation of the university are not really included. Yet, such a system will be aligned with the assessment of researchers in a similar way or research units in a similar way. So um, in the last um, 10 years, as also summarized by Ginny in her introduction, there have been various attempts in reviewing the uh, research assessment practices in promoting trustworthiness of our research. So Dora, we have heard, we also heard about the, the Leiden Manifesto for research metrics. There is also the metric tied with a recent update uh, in the World Conference of Research Integrity held in 2019. A group of us also drafted the Hong Kong Principles and which was published in 2020. So the idea of these various principles, the main goal is to broaden the assessment of research activities to cover a wider range. And many a time, these various principles and suggestions also gave, also gave some guidance as to what can be done as to provide alternatives 
for research assessment. Say, in the Hong Kong principles, the idea, other than uh, recognize broad range of activities, open science, assess reproducible research and complete reporting, and so on, and uh, recognizing other contributions and so on. The main thing here is to look at the research process as a whole, from conception of uh, the study, design of the study, data collection, reporting, dissemination, and impact. So along the whole uh, lifetime of a research project, we should be able to identify the outcome and therefore these could all contribute to the assessment and therefore to promote the trustworthiness of the research activities. So now, 10 years on, today we celebrate 10 years of DORA. Uh, what have we changed? Um, have we seen a lot of changes in the way that we assess research? I actually show you some examples of uh, RAE in the UK or, or in Hong Kong. Actually, uh, we've seen some changes, but we also haven't seen sufficient changes uh, so that the researchers were very passionate about the improvement of research assessment. We haven't seen many of the outcome yet. So what are the difficulties in changing our research assessment landscape? What are the challenges in implementing DORA or other principles? Is there a roadmap? You know, you haven't seen sufficient changes. Is there a roadmap ahead? Are we expecting something a little different in the next 10 years? So for this morning session, uh, how about in the Asia Pacific context? What have we, you know, uh, have we been um, benefiting from the worldwide trend? So here I thought about a few things. So I raised a few issues here. Uh, we, we may discuss a little further. So I look at the uh, implementation and the challenges at different levels. So first of all, as I uh, explained at the beginning, um, institutions are accountable to the government and their uh, research grant agencies, the funding agencies, in order to move on. And if the government and the funding agencies are to adopt other forms of assessment, they will have to help or we will have to help defining the key performance indicators. And it will take time and also take some effort and commitment. So at the end of the day, I think that institutions and universities do agree that some form of assessment uh, may be necessary so that indeed we will be accountable to the allocation of the funding. So the problem is, uh, you know, how to define the criteria and the components for the assessment. At the institutional level, obviously the institutional leadership has to embrace the idea and to set up policies uh, as well as set up policies so that alignment of incentives to assess the researchers will be, um, will, be, will be well aligned. And the resource and infrastructure support for the system change has to be in place. Most important of all is to engage the researchers and have the agreement of the research researchers, because you will be surprised that the researchers and a large bulk of the researchers themselves or ourselves, despite many of the individuals sign up for uh, DORA or other principles, it is always the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. Some of the assistant professors that we recruit in the university, despite the hardship of having to publish, having you know to go through the publish or and perish uh, culture, but yet if they are told that they need this number of publication in what journals and what are the performance indicators that they they need to fulfill in order to pass through tenure despite the, uh, you know, this not necessarily being a very healthy culture, but yet they will be able to work towards it. But if it is something that they don't know, they would wonder whether the new renewed system is going to be objective and fair. So therefore really working with the researchers and having the agreement and, and the alignment here is, is uh, I find that is the challenge. Despite all that, there have been lots of guidance. Uh, there are examples. So like what Jeannie was talking about, sharing of some of these examples and guidance will help because words do go around. Uh, so this is about the top guidelines. This is transparency and openness promotion guidelines. This is uh, you know, coming together uh, based on um, you know, group of colleagues from journals, uh, funders, and researchers coming up with suggestions as to uh, how we could promote 
open scholarship, open science, open data, and with suggestions of various levels of attainment on few criteria, few aspects, so that for researchers, for journals, as they are working towards the work, the process of the researcher and addressing the outcome of the work, that some of these criteria uh, could be uh, pay attention to, and therefore in time, we will be able to work out the different level of attainment. Welcome Trust as guidance for research organizations really put up something very strong and powerful. Uh, they have put up uh, the suggestion of the core principles, suggesting the adoption of DORA, as well as maybe the Leiden Manifesto or the Hong Kong principles. The idea is to be explicit about the assessment criteria and recognize the value of relevant research output as well as broaden the research, the assessment of the research output. What is really powerful is that uh, they are a welcome uh, funded research organization are expected to have a statement of commitment in implementing the principles as well as a timeline with a process and uh, a process in place for monitoring and reporting and that in the regular audits they may even ask the organizations to demonstrate that they have these levels of uh, requirement achieved to a different extent so this is really a very powerful call for the research organizations for the European Com uh, Commission, uh, they have also come together with various uh, stakeholders, also addressing, uh, you know, taking the reference of DORA, Leiden Manifesto, or Hong Kong principles, and they have come up with, uh, um, you know, a set of principles for reformed uh, research assessment system. And in fact, last year, uh, they have published the agreement on the reform of research assessment and with a particular timeline of expectations. So. They expect those who sign the agreement should, within a year, uh, come up with some uh, processes of reviewing the research assessment process, and within five years to have them to have some demonstrated progress. So again, there is strong call from the uh, European side. How about in the Asia Pacific context? I see that. Um, implementation of NORA in our part of the world, there are really ad additional difficulties. The awareness of the issues, you know, the issues of the culture of research assessment itself, awareness of DORA, awareness of the Hong Kong principles and others, I think that we still need a lot of work in the dissemination. And the determination to change the assessment criteria, you know, and then you, you really have to have the leadership and the direction. And the availability of alternatives and working models is also the key. Guidance is very much needed. There are technical support that are needed. And the support for open scholarship as a whole is moving on very, very slowly in the Asia Pacific region. And there is also very, very uh, sharp diversity and inclusion issues. Uh, in terms of discipline specific um, uh, requirement, maturity of our research systems, funding and equity, and also local culture issues. So sharing of implementation examples, doesn't matter whether these, where these examples were uh, conducted, it would be very helpful for the Asia Pacific arena. I think that we have been seeing incremental changes it will not be realistic to expect a sudden change, a disruptive change, as we were describing in the innovation. But incremental change in time, we will get somewhere. So I think that uh, anticipating the next 10 years of research assessment, I would uh, expect a sort of positive outcome. In Hong Kong, we will have a next RAE, a research assessment exercise in the 2026. Likely, similar scoring system will be in place. But I just wonder. Do we really need this type of large scale funding agency based research assessment exercises? Looking forward into the next 10 years, uh, if we have other broader based assessment, maybe even this type of activities that are very uh, energy and time consuming resource driven activities may not need it. I'm aware that in Australia, uh, there's supposed to be uh, excellence research in Australia assessment in 2023 that is postponed. We don't know. Maybe that uh, we will be adopting very, very different research assessment culture. So in the interest of time, I think that I would probably stop here. 
I have some examples of the implementation and we will see. So for those who are interested, we may discuss a little bit further. So I will, I will stop here and I would like to thank Jeannie and um, thank uh, Dora uh, for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Meha. That was really interesting. And I think you, um, you very, very eloquently explained the challenges that we have to reform of research assessment in this region. It's, it's, it's really um, quite a challenge. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that you can put your questions in the chat and then I will, um, I will ask them of Meha, but I'm going to take the prerogative of um, chairing this to ask you some questions first off, and then maybe we could come to, back to some of your specific examples. Yeah. I, I thought I thought it was really interesting that the way you, you talked about um, the importance of leadership, you know, for example, at the Wellcome Trust and through, um, you know, the sharing of, um, of good practices through the um, the top principles. I think those are two kind of quite diverse, diverse routes to um, changing a, a culture of anything. Could you perhaps just explain what you think are the what are the major things that are stopping institutions taking uh, research assessment reform forward, and what are the perhaps things that we can perhaps do as a as a sort of community to support the change? Yeah, thank you very much, Jeannie. Um, for um, fund, fund for a funder such as Welcome Trust, or even for organisation, as I was showing as an example. I think that um, although it's actually, it takes quite a lot of um, uh, sort of a strong leadership in order to put in place a certain core, no, you know, it is difficult, but nevertheless, getting a common, uh, commonly agreed idea will be the first step and it is doable. But when it comes to implementation and execution, even in one particular research organization, the machinery of conducting research and the research assessment is huge because it's, uh, you know, you have faculties that have diverse discipline and you have numbers of researchers who have, um, who are conducting very different kinds of research. So coming up with a system that are, uh, that the researchers themselves can entrust will take a long time. And many a time, some of our suggestions is to get away from simple metric, you know, get away from simple scoring. Uh, uh, let's adopt some granular assessment. Uh, the key for many of these assessments is to engage peer reviewers. So these will become very labor intensive, you know, when you come to peer review. So each of us will be contributing to the peer review. So our work profile will be different as well. So therefore from some uh, sort of simple indicators, to engaging a large community of people to engage in the research assessment, in the assessment process. All of this is really energy-driven, resource-driven, and most importantly, there need to be buy-in. So this, I think, really is um, explaining the difficulty in implementation. But let's say, say, welcome or the European Community Commission uh, the key for these two examples that I was citing is that these are calls for organizations and institutions to start looking. <laughs> the, the time frame is sort of generous, you know, you have five years. So to start looking into a reform, identify uh, elements and components that can be addressed and conduct it. So I think, I think this, I, I really think that this is the way to go. So this is one. But the community, you know, the community really need to get together. You know, impact factor is so powerful because journals suggested it, but it's adopted very quickly. So if there are uh, systems and schemes that can be adopted uh, readily, I think that uh, that could be the way to go. I can um, cite a very, very simple example. Say in some institutions, when we evaluate researchers, nowadays we uh, don't necessarily review the entire portfolio of research output or publications for a particular research investigator. Usually we ask them to cite four or five, the best four or five in the last few years, so that using these as an indicator of their portfolio and a profile. So this is a, a, a one component that can be easily adopted. So basically workable, uh, workable models um, will help. Yes, I, th I think that's exactly right. It, there has to be some some 
um, understanding that what, what we're not, as you say, we're not, we can, we don't have to, we have something to move forward to rather than just abandoning yes, what we've done in exactly. the past. Um, I have a quick, there's a couple of questions in the chat and I'm going to just pick out some of the ones that I think that might be, would be particularly great to get your, your input into. So the first one, one is about, um, about university rankings, which of course we know is a huge issue yes. in, in the Asia Pacific. So the question is, how can we wean institutions off their addiction to the university rankings? Or is it easier to improve the rankings themselves so they assess universities more sensibly? What, what would your thoughts be on that? Yeah, um, this is also a long way. Um, the ranking agencies actually use many criteria. Uh, the research output, uh, research um, reputation of the university is, um, is among them. And in a particular ranking agency, they have put in sustainability as a criteria, as one of the criteria for assessing um, universities. I think it will be very difficult to ask universities to get out of the ranking practice because sometimes uh, it is not just the universities, it's the students as well. A very, very clear example I can share with you is very, very obvious. Say for MBA programs, it, the students who enroll to these MBA programs look seriously at the university ranking for the program that they are enrolled to. So. So basically various stakeholders, or, or in recruitment, you know, when you recruit a new investigator to join a university or a research institution, they also want to know the performance of the particular organization that they are joining in. So therefore asking to abandon the, the, the ranking and the league table will not be very, very practical. So what we have been trying to work on is to um, really alert these ranking agencies in assessing universities, put, responsible research, responsible assessment, also as criteria. So therefore broaden the assessment of research uh, to cover the process, to cover policies, to cover other practices uh, in addition to whatever they are already evaluating. So probably is for, so if I consider the ranking agencies as part of our community is that they should be like the other agencies like professional bodies, like funders, like the journals, they should be part of us and therefore contribute to the criteria for evaluating institutions. So I, I think this is also one direction to go. And yeah, I think that's that's those are great points. And the other thing, of course, is that for many of these ranking systems, we we have virtually no idea how they're actually calculated. You know, the we come they come up with a number, and it's it's not not at all transparent how the how the rankings are come up with. And I think that if there was a a clearer idea of of how they were actually um, developed, then I think people might have more confidence on them. Um, it's a, it's a it's a real it's a sort of almost an arms race with rankings to some extent, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so another question about transparency more generally, which is around um, around peer review, which is that um, I think that part of obviously peer review is part of the whole research assessment system, and increasing transparency around that generally, both in for publications and also for funding agencies, might help us with some mm -hmm. to some extent. Do, do you have any thoughts on how we might take that forward in in a way to sort of improve research assessment? Yes, I think that um, when we are looking forward to research assessment in the next 10 years, there are so several elements. Peer review uh, will be one important element. And another element is uh, open scholarship. Open scholarship and peer review goes hand in hand. You know, open scholarship is, uh, uh, is a practice of research and it is about sharing. And it has a very strong element of peer support. So all of that is asking for training of researchers. So training of researchers as we are progressing along our professional uh, uh, attainment, we will not be just conducting research in our own arena, but we also need to learn about uh, pro uh, providing responsible review as a practice. So all of this also need training. So this is also part of the challenge for adopting you know, open scholarship and DORA or other principles, especially in this part of the world. I think some of you in the audience are, are very experienced in, in journals, in publication as editors and so on, engaging reviewers in the Asia Pacific region. I'm talking about a few countries where we have a large population, China, India, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, even participation in traditional, you know, traditional peer review of journal articles is not equal. You know, there's a, 
<laughs> there's a strong element of some other regions review or re reviewing this part of the world, you know, that type of activity. So all of this, you know, peer review is a very, very large arena that the research community really need to move on to have the fair training, adequate training, adequate support. And this would also be a very, very critical point for us to move on in terms of uh, assessment. Now, I can also take it closer. Let's not broaden it to peer review as a whole. I can just talk about promotion and tenure of assessment of uh, investigators so that they can get their tenure. We will send the portfolio of the researcher concerned to reviewers. Usually these are researchers uh, on par or in peer institutions. So these review has to be fair, responsible, and unbiased. And sometimes you invite five reviewers, uh, and you know, I think all of you are very, very familiar with this practice. So responsible peer review clearly is just as important as responsible research uh, uh, project execution. Thank you. That's a great point. And I, I think that points to this sort of rounds this out nicely, the, uh, the importance of, you know, having a community um, approach to changing research assessment. And also, as you've pointed out, the fact that we need to be aware that this is the global problem and what works for what's important in one particular part of the world may not be, uh, will be um, less important perhaps elsewhere, but needs more of a focus. So thank you very much, Meha. Um, we'll stop uh, this session now. Um, we now have um, a 10 minute break. Um, uh, we're going to be, and then we'll be coming back to a panel discussion. So don't go away. Keep keep yourself on the on this um, on this Zoom uh, meeting. Uh, and in the break, we'll share a video from community members about what Dora means to them. But thank you, Meha. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've been part of the DORA initiative since right from the start, when a handful of us sat down a decade ago to agree on three notions. That the journal impact factor was being systematically misused for research assessment. That GIF was a single feature that could be changed with great effect and without having to redesign the whole scientific process. And that this was a systemic issue that involved equally all stakeholders, journals, funders, research institutions and the community. We thus addressed specific recommendations for each of these groups in the declaration. For me, Dora focused attention on a key underappreciated topic at the time. How can we attain an informed, fair research assessment process based on a more diverse, meaningful set of criteria than misleading proxy metrics? Dora has played a part in convincing many to view bibliometrics in a more nuanced way and to apply them more thoughtfully, if at all. With fierce competition for resources, the topic is more relevant than ever. The proliferation of research integrity issues is just one warning sign of a system under strain. I think Dora remains influential because it offers practical advice and realistic suggestions. It's remarkable that after a decade, the misuse of GIF remains a life issue to be solved. Hello, I'm Anna Hatch. And to me, Dora means that the scholarly community cares deeply about the ways we make decisions about who gets to conduct research. And it's more than that. It means that there are tens of thousands of individuals and organizations around the world that are working to de-emphasize journal prestige and value a wider range of researcher contributions in order to promote a healthy academic ecosystem. And by sharing experiences of these individuals and organizations working to improve the ways that research is assessed and facilitating dialogue and developing resources, Dora shows us that progress is made when we work together. For me, Dora means taking an ambitious aspiration to reform research assessment and looking at practical ways to make that happen. This includes raising awareness of new tools and processes in research assessment, responsible use of metrics, and developing new policies and practices for hiring, promotion and funding decisions. There are still lots of challenges ahead, but 10 years of DORA has seen global efforts across scholarly disciplines for fair and more equitable research assessment. Happy birthday, DORA! 
To me, DORA is the concrete expression of what was previously just a set of principles around research assessment. It's become a global coalition and an innovative organisation that has passionate volunteers and staff that has been able to lead the debate in research assessment, develop concrete resources to help move research assessment forward and has great convening power. It's become a global force in thinking about the future of research assessment and I believe it's done so in a way that will benefit researchers, the academic community more widely, funders and indeed the global public. To me, DORA is a kind of support. Ten years ago, when China was in preparation of reforming the publication-dominated quantitative assessment, DORA, the declaration, came to birth and it inspired and supported us a lot. Since then, I'm glad that our practices became part of DORA's global initiative, and I hope in the future our practices will contribute more to DORA. For me, DORA means that better research can be achieved by assessing researchers and research on its own merit through a broad range of activities, collaborations, and possible outcomes. DORA also means a community of individuals and organizations interested in developing and promoting responsible research assessment practices through different tools and resources, case studies, community of practices, and engagement grants DORA has been an inspiring initiative worldwide and a powerful laboratory for change in research assessment. Happy birthday, DORA. What does DORA mean to me? In short, hope. Hope for a world where the practices of research assessment are constructed by people for people. Hope that as a worldwide community, we can face the complexities of reform together and hope that our reform efforts can create a research culture that is responsive to the needs and aspirations of all scholars.
All right, welcome back everyone. I hope you enjoyed those uh, two brief slideshows. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to um, tag us on Twitter, the hash hashtag is Dora10 and we're the, um, ha the handle is at Dora Assessment. I would love to hear your thoughts about it, particularly what Dora's meant to you and what your experience has been with it. So um, I'm really delighted to now move into the panel session. We have four um, fantastic people who are going to talk to us about their experience of research assessment in their part of the world. Um, and we have the opportunity to ask uh, questions of them at the end. So please, just a reminder, please put your questions in the, um, in the chat. Um, you can vote them up uh, with a thumbs up if you'd like them to see them answered and we will uh, come to them at the end. So um, I'm first off, I'm going to just briefly um, uh, introduce them and then they will go on to a two minute introduction of themselves about what research assessment means to them in their part of the world, particularly their experience with Dora. So our speakers today are um, uh, Spencer Lilly from Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand, um, Yu Sasaki from Kyoto University Research Administration Centre in J Japan, Desapta Erwin Irawan from Bandung Institute of Technology in Indonesia, and Mamita Kohli from the Indian Institute of Science in India. So welcome to all of our panelists. So I will start off with asking Spencer if you'd like to talk to us about what research assessment means to you. Uh, kia ora, Jenny, um, and uh, hello everyone um, from New Zealand. Wonderful um, that you've all gathered today. Um, Research assessment in New Zealand um, follows a fairly similar pattern to what my ha was uh, talking about in regard to Hong Kong, England and um, Australia. Uh, we have what is known as the Performance Based Research Fund. And as you can guess from the name, um, performance is very much a critical aspect of that. So really um, our next exercise takes place in 2026 and uh, that has been delayed, uh, it should have happened next year I believe, um, but it was delayed because of the global pandemic. Um, so basically we uh, as researchers are all assessed, um, our um, assessments then are reviewed by panels and then um, decisions are made about uh, our individual performances that impacts on the funding that our universities receive. So uh, as you can guess, uh, universities are all keen for us to do our utmost to ensure that they get the maximum funding available. And we're only talking a, about a pool of $315 million, um, New Zealand dollars that is. Um, so for other parts of the world, that may not sound much, but um, yeah, here it's a significant part of our university funding. So um, one of the critical things um, that our PBRF system has been going for over 20 years now. So it has um, so had an impact on the reputation of our universities, um, which of course is also governed by um, all those global ranking systems as well. What we're finding with the next round of um, PBRF is that there is going to be more emphasis on trying to identify what research excellence looks like, um, not just relying on the impact factor that um, has um, sort of been there in the past, but actually looking at um, more about the package of um, research that you're doing and the narrative behind it and the contribution that it makes. Um, my particular area of speciality is in Indigenous knowledge, particularly um, how it relates to Māori in New Zealand, and it's we're also looking at how we can increase the um, the awareness and the impact of Māori research for Māori communities in New Zealand, um, and the same with Pacific peoples as well. New Zealand has got the largest um, population of Pacific peoples in the world. Um, so we're also looking to see how we can improve outcomes for Pacific peoples as well. Um, but what we're also um, aware of, and we're talking about the peer review stuff that we were um, talking about just before the break. Um, in my area, I've been doing some research around that peer review process and um, its relevance to Māori scholars. Um, and Amongst the findings that I've 
um, had so far is that really um, Indigenous scholars and Māori scholars in general have problems with the peer review process. Um, that is because editorial boards and um, peer reviewers that are on most of our journals do not have um, people with the cultural capacity to actually review this um, material um, in, in a way that um, Indigenous researchers would expect it um, to be reviewed. Um, so, yeah, there's a number of issues. Um, open access, there's going to be more emphasis on open access by our external funders in the future. One of our larger um, funders has already announced that all external all research funded by them has to be open access in the future, and we expect the others to be going that way. So, yeah, sorry, that's probably my two minutes plus. Um, I'm happy to answer questions later, though. Great, thank you for that, Spencer. That's really interesting, particularly the, um, the focus on Indigenous research, which is something that we're um, very keen for us to to um, to be thinking about. So um, I'll now pass over to you, um, Yu Sasaki. Would you like to uh, give us your perspective on research assessment in your part of the world? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me here today. My name is Yu Sasaki. I am a research administrator at Kyoto University. My academic background is in area studies in India, so I'm happy that Momita is here today. We had earlier exchanged our experiences with the DORA Community Grant, which both of us were recipients. And uh, I've been engaged with this topic of research, uh, responsible research assessment while trying to figure out and explore what role can we play in the conventional university system in Japan. I believe this uh, relatively new position of research administrators can be an agent of change, hopefully. And we engage with the um, researchers on a daily basis and who are frustrated with the inappropriate and unfair use of bibliometrics, uh, while other colleagues are handling uh, bibliometric data for university rankings or for use by various departments for uh, strategic management purposes. And we do these two totally different things together. And on the one hand, um, obsession for metrics and the belief that metrics is the only way to ensure objectivity. Not to say that you know my colleagues are not in that view, but uh, uh, the overall obsession is just so persistent and we sometimes feel uh, helpless. But on the other hand, uh, many of our colleagues have bits of ideas of how to uh, how we can change the system in a way that we encourage diversity of research and researchers at universities. But there's no platform on the basis of which that we can share these ideas. So we took advantage of the community grant to get together and do some preliminary mapping exercises. I am going to show this uh, mapping that we made uh, with the community grant uh, later if I have time. And uh, so in that sense, DORA has been a welcoming leverage in a, a country, uh, Japan too. And I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. I love that map that I, you can see an enormous amount of work that went into that piece of work. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Desapta, would you like to uh, now give your experience of, uh, of research assessment in your part of the world? Thank you, uh, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. And, and I also uh, wrote a short notes regarding this meeting. So you can uh, read uh, by yourself as a whole for a complete context. But I can summarize that uh, the situation of research assessments in Indonesia is not very far from um, observing uh, the sum of citations, age index, uh, still all of those things. And mo I can say all of the metrics to assess researcher in Indonesia all is based on those um, uh, values, those numbers, right? So it's not really uh, a change in the national level, 
uh, regarding on how we measure uh, performance. But in personal level, I can say that we have some change, some shift of uh, perspective at personal level that uh, some of our researcher has uh, increased awareness uh, not to only uh, show off the metric of the journal where they publish the, the article, but they also have this awareness to show the content of their articles, right? So this is very important. So in my uh, position as one of the uh, open science promoter in Indonesia, so I try to use that energy to promote the importance of sharing the, the substance, right? Not the prestige or not just the prestige, yeah? So I, I, I cannot, uh, forbid people, my friends, to celebrate that they are, their article have been published in a high impact journal. I can, uh, I cannot pub forbid them to do that. But um, in additional as as additional activities, I push them also to share the substance, right? What they are writing, what they are researching about, uh, uh, what are the results, and how the results may affect the community. So I push uh, those uh, colleagues uh, to do that as well. So yeah, that's a uh, sum up version of my notes. Thank you, uh, Ginny. Thank you, Deceptor. I love that concept of using the energy to um, to encourage people to think about the substance, not just the, the metrics. You're absolutely right. You yeah. can't get away from the prestige factor, but you can encourage yeah. alternatives. Thank you. Um, uh, Mamita, would you like to talk about your experience of research assessment in your part of the world? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, so first of all, yeah, greetings, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, as Jenny mentioned, I'm Mamita, and a bit about myself. So I'm an uh, STA policy researcher. My research work is primarily focused on topics like open access, accessibility of research data, and research assessment. And currently, I'm associated with the International Science Council as a consultant and also working as a visiting researcher at the Department of Science and Technologies Policy Research Center at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India. And I'm really thrilled to share my experience, uh, what is happening in India, per se. Obviously, the over-reliance on readily available journal indices that all the other panelists and the speakers have told it's it's a reality in India as well. So, but um, to address this issue, uh, me and my colleague Suchira Ditta, we worked on a project to understand how the research assessment happens in India. And of course, we are thankful to Dora uh, for providing impartial financial assistance to us for this work as well. So what we figured out that uh, in India, we have actually a mix of both, uh, both use of qualitative and quantitative metrics. So few institutions, uh, which are uh, which are high ranked institution as per se, they use more as qualitative uh, metrics for assessing the researcher, whereas most of the institutions best their research assessment on, on uh, quantitative metrics like impact factor or H index or citation and so on and so forth. Whereas the national ranking framework, we have an university national ranking framework, which has a quite good chunk goes for this kind of bibliometric ranking. And there are a lot of non-transparency on how this kind of rankings are used. Uh, through our project with uh, the, this research assessment project that I was talking about, uh, we could make actually some good progress there. Our national funding agency has shown some interest in this conversation, and we are in talk with them to take it forward to, to make the assessment framework more responsible. And another interesting uh, part was that we have been able to engage with diverse group of stakeholder in Indian research ecosystem, including early career, mid career researchers, faculties from research institutions. And, it, and this project helped us to raise awareness and our next step is, of course, to note how we can make the research assessment framework more responsible. 
yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Mamita. I, I really love your idea of uh, making sure that you embrace the diversity of everyone involved in the research system. And also, it sounds like you've done a fantastic piece of work in raising awareness with the funders. So that that is, that is um, that's really good to good to see. So I'm going to kick off with one question to everybody um, and it's um, and we'll go around and then there's an opportunity to ask questions from from the audience if and just a reminder to everybody just put your questions in the chat and uh, and we'll, we'll uh, I'll direct them to the to the panel members so so the question for all of you to think about is um, is what's Dora's impact been in your part of the world so Dora in particular has it had an impact and Perhaps just a little follow on to that. If it if you haven't hasn't had as much effect as you'd like it to have had, what do you think maybe the barriers to that might have been? So Spencer, I'll I'll start with you. Uh, I'll be honest, and I'll, I I will say I I hadn't really heard about Dora until a couple of months ago, um, and I think that probably shows um, the level of awareness. Um, I think of myself as a highly engaged researcher. Um, I was a librarian before I was also um, a, a researcher academic, um, and certainly it had not come to my awareness um, that Dora was there. I think um, some of the uh, issues I was talking about in my two minute um, um, piece um, show that there is huge potential for what um, Dora is promoting. Um, and that it has started to be taken on board, particularly by some of our funders. Um, I believe that with our performance-based research fund, although that they are trying to adjust that to make sure that early career researchers and researchers from other marginalised communities have um, a fairer go in that process, I think the universities are still at that point where they want to get maximum um, benefit from the performance-based research fund. So there will be, you know, challenges there for us. But um, our um, funders are also looking at those narrative forms of curriculum vitae that um, have been promoted. And I think that is something um, to be encouraged and looking at being able to use them across multiple funders rather than having a different format for every funder. So, you know, facilitating that process and actually trying to think about um, what it is that they're actually looking for in terms of the types of research that people were doing and assessing it from different perspectives, particularly, um, as I said before, the Indigenous and Pacifica perspectives about what impact means in those particular um, contexts. So, yeah, I think, yeah, there's a lot of work still to be done, but I think we're moving in the right direction. Thanks, Spencer. I think I think your your answer kind of points to the fact that, you know, for many researchers, they just have to be engaged in getting their research out and that, you know, the, the issues such as the re bigger reform of research assessment is is just really challenging, I think, to engage with on a on a on a regular basis. I will just say with regard to the funders that we um, Dora co-convenes two um, uh, research funder discussion groups, one in, one's in the Asia Pacific, and we do have researchers from across Australia and New Zealand. So I think that we are getting to the point where the funders are beginning to talk to each other about what, what opportunities there are for, um, for example, engaging with, with narrative CVs. Um, okay, so I'll go to you now. What would you, what would you like to um, say, what's the impact of uh, Dora been in your part of the world? Mm. Thank you, Ginny. I would like to share one slide, if I may. Can you see the slides? Yeah, this is just one page. And uh, so uh, this is from a report available from the Ministry of Education in Japan uh, called MEXT uh, on the survey conducted last year to understand the research assessment practices across the uh, uh, Japanese universities and all the major research performing institutions. And uh, I was part of this committee to oversee this survey. So uh, we added one question about the awareness of uh, DORA. 
and also light manifesto. Uh, so the respondents are usually an administrative staff in charge of submitting research assessment requirements at the universities. And as you can see uh, on the left hand side, uh, to the question, do you know Dora? To who, uh, and those who answered yes is uh, only 31% combined, these orange parts, but um, mostly close to 70% of respondents uh, did not know Dora. And uh, who, personally speaking, I, I think this is a quite good number because I, uh, on a daily basis, we do not uh, you know, share uh, understanding about DORA or, or you know, uh, the related responsible research assessment initiatives. But uh, so this is 31%. I thought it's a, not a bad figure. But uh, so does this awareness uh, level affect behaviors? So the, we, our colleagues have done uh, cross tabulation analysis and um, so whoever answered yes, do they use uh, uh, journal impact factor in the individual performance evaluation at the institutional level? Actually, this uh, um, looks a bit contradictory. Whoever is aware of DORA is also using the journal impact factor in the, uh, the university level. So it's a, a personal level, you are aware of uh, DORA but that the, as an institution, um, they are still using uh, general impact factor. And as you can see, the, it's not as prevalent as I guess in the case of, I, I don't know, Europe or elsewhere, we do probably use less, uh, we are not too much dependent on the general impact factor, but it is ironically, uh, I guess, increasing. So we have to uh, be, carefully watching this uh, uh, statistics and possibly uh, respondents awareness uh, is not linked to this um, system change. And um, one reason might be because it's a structural problem that needs more attention at the national level, whatever the, uh, the criteria set at the national level is uh, trickled down to the uh, uh, understanding and appreciation of the way uh, we assess uh, research at the institutional level, you know, that's definitely uh, linked, even though there is no direct uh, uh, linkage in the Japanese system. So um, uh, in that sense, I think uh, uh, we have to have um, uh, talk to each other and uh, as an administrator from the bottom up, uh, of course, the top-down kind of uh, understanding is uh, necessary, but also uh, we need to mutually empower and inform the stakeholders, and we are one of the stakeholders in that sense, yes. Thanks, you. That's that's really interesting to see. It's it's it shows that we've still got a fair way to go uh, in in kind of promoting research assessment. I says it sounds to me like there's some individual you know thinking going on it, but not maybe not all brought together at this point. So, but that's really valuable information. It would be it would be very interesting to see what that looks like um across sort of different countries. Um, so I'll pass on to Desapta. So what what's um what what's your what Dora's impact been in in your part of the world? Uh, yeah. So I think we have, at least we have three impacts from DORA uh, to our uh, academic and research activity here in Indonesia. One is uh, DORA has provided us with uh, guidance and, and some sort of guidance and directions for us to get to uh, to get into this transformative uh, journey. Because previously, um, the public here doesn't know that we are allowed to see uh, or to assess people and their works based not only from the journal citation, journal impact factor, and also uh, 
to sort of matrix. We, we doesn't know that, we don't know that until Dora um, uh, showed up, right? So one is uh, for providing guidance. And then the second, by providing the guidance, automatically Dora has uh, broadening our perspective that uh, not looking at age index is not a sin, <laughs> right? So that's the, the second uh, impact. And the third one, uh, by looking at Dora and the energy shown by some of my colleagues and then uh, the university leaders and also in the ministry, some of those people has um, approved that sharing a simple homemade YouTube tutorial video can have more value to students than just sharing links to peer review papers, right? So uh, Dora plus the COVID pandemic, uh, we have this three impacts in, in, in our academic life. That's it, Ginny. Thanks to Sapcha. I love that idea. I think you're absolutely right. It, finally, we are beginning to get the understanding that the citation itself is not really what matters. It's the, you know, it's the what, it's the how you share it and the wider impact. So that's really good to hear that that's um that's that's beginning to happen. Mamita, what about you? Where what some Dora's impact been in your part of the world? Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, so as I was listening to you, uh, Dasapta, and I feel that yeah, exactly. We also see very similar. First of all, that. Uh, the awareness of Dora is very, very less in this part of the world. Um, when we embarked on this research assessment project, we realized, uh, if I take it in these two parts, one is the funding agencies and one is the uh, researchers, uh, individual researchers and institute. Individual researchers and institute, they are hardly aware of it. And among the five funding agencies whom we have talked to, uh, only uh, only one is signatory of Dora and rest are not. But uh, slowly, because of this discussion, either be it Dora or Leiden Manifesto or Hong Kong Declaration, it's actually created some kind of awareness. So now there is a talk that we need to reform the assessment. Uh, in our part of the world, for example, in India, in the funding agency actually use qualitative metrics, so a peer review based system. But unfortunately, when we deep dived into it, we realized that this qualitative metrics is actually driven by quantitative. So people do have, have a general impact factor in their mind or citation in their mind when do they do the peer review assessment. But the discussion on this responsible uh, matrices has changed it. I, I mean, at least started the discussion. I won't say that it there is a transformative change, but there is a slow but incremental change that is happening. That is the most uh, significant impact of DORA or uh, all such work that we see in, in research assessment sphere. Whereas in the individual researchers level, we really need a lot of awareness building, which is really completely lacking. And uh, certain other things that is completely lacking in our part of the world is the transparency, um, both in qualitative or quantitative metrics. There is no, uh, there is no uh, incentive for open scholarship at all. That would, if we change that, uh, we would be able to adapt to uh, responsible metrics and promote fairness and transparency much better. That's what we feel. But overall, uh, even if it is slow, but impact of these discussions are very important. At least it started or it moved the discussion to the right way. So that's all for me at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Mamita. I think your point about how um, there's no incentives for open research is really important. And that kind of ties into something I touched on in my presentation about how this is all interlinked, that it requires everybody, it requires thinking about it from all angles, doesn't it? And not just from the point of view of simple metrics around research papers. Um, so we have a, uh, some questions and comments in the chat. I'm going to kick off with those and then I may come back to some others that I had for, for all of you. So I'm going to start a question from a question from Amanda Pearson, which is really interesting. She asked the question that um, it's 
that it's great that it, there's in um, proof of uh, inclusion of impact in a narrative assessment is very positive. How, but what do we do for when researchers are doing really long term projects? You know, we're talking about multi year projects or because it takes a project that takes a long time, for example, to translate into um, to policy or industry. How do how do we really meaningfully fully assess um, impact there and how can we perhaps move away from you know, what we do right now? Um, you, I'm going to start with you on that question, because I think it's possibly a question that you probably struggle with on your in your in your daily work. Yes, well, I, I have, uh, yes, exactly, we are uh, struggling uh, with this topic of uh, impact. And then, uh, so, um, how do you, how to assess uh, impact or, or understand the impact? Um, we are in the middle of uh, this process. And uh, um, as I said, I have no answer, but uh, there is um, uh pressure from the government to uh you know try and find out the way to measure assessment and uh, of course uh you know at the aggregate level everybody is looking at the uh, uh countable numbers or the you know the measurable ways uh to assess impact so we are now how do you say uh even before trying to understand what the impact can be and uh, what is the way that its impact is uh, uh, expressed or, or, or captured. Uh, we are, before talking, understanding that, we are talking about how to measure it. So we really have to go backwards and then uh, uh, to understand the, the impact pathways, and uh, we are not at all at the stage of even, you know, uh, having this impact uh, case studies to begin with. So, so I don't know. Maybe some other panelists might have a bit of view on that. Yes. Yes, I'm Spencer or Desatra. I wonder if you, one of you might like to take it from the point of view of academics. You know, with very long term work, how would you like to see that? research sort of meaningfully assessed? Um, I, I, I think um, from my perspective, it, it's going back to really who defines what that impact is. Um, and sort of certainly from a funder's perspective, they should be looking at the long-term investment um, and that, that, you know, sort of that, there is going to be something meaningful that comes out of it in the end that will have an impact eventually. Um, and, uh, you know, so there may be milestones along the way. But it's also looking at this, uh, the community that you're working with as well, in terms of how they um, evaluate what you're doing and its impact on them. Um, so I think, you know, we, we do tend to get very hung up on you know sort of journal metrics and the like but the, to people outside academia they don't always mean that much it's a, it's about what what benefit is this research going to have for my community um and you know sort of when will it be delivered and what what will be the implications for us and i think that 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 is one of the things that uh, perhaps you know with the open um access uh sort of move that we may you know get stronger appreciation of in the future that you know so communities will have much better access to our research than possibly they have had in the past and that can only be a good thing yes i'd agree with that for certain Desapta, did you you were going to jump in yeah um uh, thank you so my position is still in favor of the grassroots uh, because uh, grassroots, the researchers it's themselves, uh, is the creator of the science as well as the users of the science, right? So uh, it will largely, largely rely to them. So what the long-term um, efforts uh, would be 
try to convince them that we need to split. If we have an article, we need to split it into two parts. The article itself is the substance, the content, but the journal is the prestige uh, part, right? So we need to convince them to split it into two uh, and then make sure that they also take pride of the article itself, not only the journal, right? So that way they can um, freely and happily share the article without having to mention where the uh, where the journal that published the article. So I think it's uh, it's one of the incremental step that uh, I don't know maybe Momita uh, mentioned uh, previously, right? So it's slowly, but if we can level that perspective, and then. I think uh, slowly we can have a more responsible uh, research assessment. Right? We cannot force the, the situation into faster period. Uh, so it's going to be slow. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I have this large, uh, many gray hair. Thanks, Desatta. I will just say, in case you're not following the chat, um, Desatta is a highly skilled illustrator and does marvelous um, illustrations of all sorts of things. So if you're not ha having looking at them, ha make sure you, you jump into the chat and we'll share some of them afterwards. Mamita, would you like to comment on this? Because I just wondered in particular with regard to, you said funders were beginning to become aware of um, your research assessment in India. Are they thinking about the long-term effects, uh, long-term uh, assessment of research? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, that's that's another interesting part because of uh, because we have been able to kind to some extent convince them that um, so far they never looked into uh, any impact of the research assessment, like or the societal impact. That's completely missing. So we can, we have been able to convince that there are two different ways at least to look into a research. One is the societal impact, and another might be a transformative impact, which directly does not translate to a societal impact immediately. Because if I see from the question also, not every research is translated immediately. So how do we assess this two different kind of research? And uh, to our uh, understanding, of course, this is very, very beginning of this discussion. It's just the peer review or the community's input is what is what would matter to understand how we assess both kinds of research. And also we have to make this community not just a researcher community. So there is an and there is a discussion on the inclusion of civil, civil society organization, industry participation in the assessment process. Some of those research would need more broader participation in the assessment. Some probably the academics are enough to do it. So this is where our discussion lies at this moment. And in down the line, maybe in a few months, we would try to broaden this discussion. And also there is a discussion that, or even the funding, one of the funding agencies, right, they might even would be ready to do a pilot as well. But of course, it's the steps that we have uh, planned down the line. So yeah, we have to see for another year, maybe then we would have a better understanding where do we stand. Thank you. Thanks, Mamita. Um, so just a question back to the, all the panel. Um, I, a question for you in your region, just thinking about who do you think the key actors are um, to influence about research assessment and maybe who the key barriers are, because I think that comes to the heart of what we've been talking about. So I'm going to start with Deceptor for that one. Who, who would you think are the key actors in this space and who, what, are the, what are the barriers? Yeah, so uh, the key actors uh, especially in Indonesia, uh, it should be the government, right? Because maybe 95% of our research uh, funding came from come from the government. So the government should be the key factors. But instead of waiting for them to change, which is going to be uh, taking a lot of time, uh, it's uh, I have more positive uh, intention to go into to put the researcher itself as the key factor 
right? Mm -hmm. Because if most of the people are not talking about journal impact factor, then why the government stay uh, telling us to measure the journal, journal impact factor, right? If most of the people are not talking about the number, right? <laughs> so uh, I, I choose to put the researcher as the key factor. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Spencer, what about you? Who do you think are the, um, the key actors in this in reforming assessment? Okay, um, in the government sector, we have what is called the Tertiary Education Commission. So they're a government department that oversee the performance of um, all our higher education institutions. And so they are the ones that control the performance-based research fund. Um, so that, although a lot of people that feed into it are from our universities. So, you know, we, we are the ones that populate the panels that do the assessments. We're the ones that help um, decide what the, what the assessment is going to look like in the future. So there, there's a bit of a, you know, sort of relationship there. But the other three major sort of um, people involved are the um, another government department, our Ministry of Business and Innovation and Employment, who we just refer to as MB for obvious reasons, um, our Health Research Council and our Royal Society. They are the three major funders in New Zealand um, for sort of research. And so they, they are the ones that uh, sort of really trying to um, shift the landscape a bit more, uh, as I said before, into the open access um, environment. So yeah, they would be the main ones. Great, thank you. So we've got researchers and funders at this point. So Mamita, what about you? Who are the main, um, the main players in your area? I have to say the same. However, if we see that again, the government or the funding agency in India, uh, they are the major, the major chunk of funds and for research comes from them. However, they are not the major influencer when the culture is set. So it's the science leaders in the country sets the research culture. So uh, the science leaders, the senior researchers are the one, if they push the change, it will happen. However, the senior leaders or the science leaders of the country represent the disciplinary diversity. And this disciplinary diversity or the disciplinary culture does not come from, let's say, within the country. It comes actually or it gets guided by the West. So they represent, let's say, if I would say my academic training is in chemistry. And so I know that for sure that the way we see or follow is exactly how the global culture is shaped. So we would be able to see the change when there is a global change happening. Of course, the funders pushing would have, and it has been making certain impact, but definitely in our case, as I see from our research culture, it will come if this cultural shift happens in the US and Europe, we will also slowly adapt to it because we are so closely interconnected to that ecosystem. And also our researchers is very interconnected to that ecosystem. So we would be able to see cultural changes in the researchers with the disciplinary context. That's what I feel it would happen. Thank you. Thanks, Amita. Um, you, what about you? Who do you think are the, the major actors in your region for um, uh, changing research assessment? Thank you. I agree with everyone, and uh, especially Desapta said that, uh, of course, uh, government plays a major role, but it takes a lot of time, and it, it's not, uh, you know, realistic to expect something will happen uh, automatically. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, since, like, we have this uh, uh, map created, we have some good uh, response from the researchers who share the similar kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, the critical points about uh, how to look at the assessment uh, uh, issues. And so we are looking uh, forward to working and uh, maybe some sort of co-creation process with the researchers. And uh, on the basis of this mapping, uh, we expect something will happen. But uh, from the point of view of humanities and social sciences, we have a lot to 
uh, learn when we discussed initially about the core values and the change of co uh, research culture. Um, there is especially the uh, you know the history of science and the history of technology. Uh, these wealth of knowledge can be uh, you know a good uh, reflection point for us to understand the culture uh, now, cultural change. What would be the you know ideal way to change? So hopefully uh, some dialogue will happen on the basis of this. Yes, maybe. Thank you for that. I really love the way that everybody is putting the researchers right at the heart of this. I think that's a that's a really interesting and important um, uh, kind of perspective. So we're almost at an end. I've got one question for all of you. You've got one minute no, in no more to answer it in, uh, which is almost impossible. The question is, what does responsible research assessment look like to you in 10 minutes? And because Decept has done that fantastic um, background, he you can go first, Decept. Decept. Yeah. So uh, my one minute message is just uh, take off your precious mask, right? And uh, take breath of your work. One minute. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mamita, what does responsible research assessment look like to you in 10 years? Uh, so I believe that that assessment, uh, it would it would be a framework which will uh, uh, recognize the balance between a qualitative and quantitative metrics, and it will actually make use that it is correctly using this quantitative metrics as the Sapta is pointing out so many times. And we should strive to encourage diversity and inclusivity. So in the 10 year lens, if you have more diversity and inclusivity in the assessment framework uh, and uh, diversity of outcome, social impact, then I would think that that is like a framework uh, to some extent that I would look forward to see in 10, 10 years down the line. Thank you. Thank you, Mamisha. You, you, what would you, what do you think it looks like in 10 years? Um, I, I want to be uh, optimistic, but I'm not too, you know, uh, you know, I, I can't be too optimistic. So uh, I guess even after 10 years, journal impact factor might stay and uh, it will be you know a uh, very strong force so uh, to constantly and continuously engage with that uh, and uh, you know like uh, someone said you know bring uh, the university ranking uh, to the same community of uh, responsible research assessment that might be uh, you know uh, one way to go forward so we really need this community to grow within Japan and uh, globally. And uh, hopefully we will have a kind of co-creation process along with researchers and uh, research administrators and uh, hopefully funders also come uh, together in the same uh, platform. That would be my ideal 10 years time. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Spencer, over to you. One one minute on what you'd like it to look um, like in ten years. Uh, yeah, I guess greater transparency around research assessment, um, less competition between institutions, and more collaboration. Really, I I guess, and making sure that um, we're not the ones that are singing our own praises. That they are. Those praises are coming from the communities that we're doing the work for. They are the ones that should be assessing the value of our research. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. That's a great point to end on. I think really kind of grounds us back in why we do research for the in the first instance, really. So I'd like to thank the panel, you, Desapta, Momita, and Spencer. Thank you very much. And I'm going to hand back to Haley, our acting program director, to wrap this up. Thank you very much, Ginny. I'll go ahead and share my screen. All righty. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge all of the folks who made this possible. Uh, first and foremost, as Ginny said, uh, panelists and our keynote speaker, um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us, to hear these questions, and to let us know what our priorities should be for the next 10 years. Um, we just thank you for such a fantastic discussion. 
Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge all the folks who uh, from DORA who helped to make this possible. Uh, Anna Hatch, DORA's first program director, who is instrumental in early planning for DORA at 10. A very, very warm acknowledgement of DORA's chairs, Stephen Curry, and in particular, Ginny Barber, who has been our MC today. Um, both of our chairs uh, have volunteered countless hours of their own time to make DORA and the celebration what it is today. Uh, additional thanks to our steering committee and executive board who also donate their time to shape the vision and priorities for DORA. And speaking of donating time, a big thanks to those of you uh, from the steering committee who are on our 10th anniversary task force, Laura Rovelli from Folek, Claire Milton from Company Biologists, Stephen Ginny, all helped me out quite a bit. And I'd also like to thank Doris Policy Associates, Queen Saikia and Sudeep Anandi for their support moderating these sessions. Many thanks to Chris Hartgrink of Liberate Science for their wisdom and support with local event management, logistics, moderating these sessions and creating the What Does Dora Mean to Me video. Now, I'd like to end this call with a reminder that there is still much more to come for the month of May to celebrate Dora's 10th anniversary. Keep an eye on our Twitter at Dora Assessment and also uh, at our webpage for the Dora retrospective blog that Ginny and I are working on that will be released to cap off our week celebration. We'll have summaries of our plenary sessions, which will be posted in the next few weeks, and the recordings of the plenary sessions will be posted this week. And I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight that we have over 20 local events from 15 countries celebrating DORA at 10. Uh, I encourage you to check it out at sfdora.org, DORA at 10 at the top of the page, to register for one of our 12 upcoming hybrid or virtual events that are open to the public. And these events are organized by community members. And so we've got quite a wide range of really exciting discussion topics for you to choose from. And if you're inspired by what you saw today, we are still accepting local event submissions. So if you'd like to pull some of your colleagues into a room for a coffee chat, let us know. And we'd be happy to feature that as part of Dora at 10. Finally, I thank the audience for their attendance and thoughtful questions. Uh, this passionate community um, has really made the movement what it is today. And it is the same community that will continue to innovate, implement, and iterate on responsible research assessment reform into the next decade. We look forward to the next 10 years with you. And with that, I'll bring this plenary session to a close. Thank you, everyone.